What are we doing? I think we're gonna watch something and react to it. <laughs> no. Oh, then this must be where we strip. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to our stupid directions. It's I'm Corbin. I'm Rick. You follow us on Instagram, Instagram and Twitter. Comment on the Patreon, follow us on Twitter, the bell, the notification bell. Bang! You follow us on personal YouTube channels. Bang! It's so Thanks juicy. In the description. Instagram and Twitter are gonna come for you in the middle of the night like this, and they're gonna get your ears. <laughs> so much. Somebody was uh, no. watching this right now. Nobody was doing anything. Tripping. They were either on shrooms. Or they were smoking weed. How dare you support and drug use? Just, what I just did freaked them out. It did really not. bad. It did not. Yep. One person. And I'm still talking to that person. Anyways, we're doing a little short documentary. Right now? Uh, Where's the crew? Here. Oh, you mean we're going to react to one? 100 years of Jalayanwala Bag. How the massacre unfolded. 100 years ago, the Jalayanwala Bag massacre shook the conscience of a nation, but what were the circumstances that led to this tragedy? I think this is the massacre we learned about in America. Is this a hundred years ago, so that would have been, yeah. Okay, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Where we walked by where I it think happened. So. I right? could be wrong. Uh, News 18 travels to Amritsar. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. We were gonna go in there and it was closed. Yeah. To tell, retell the story of the killings that marked the beginning of the end of the British Empire. Yeah. Okay, so I believe this is what um, our friend in, in uh, Amritsar helped us out with. When we were walking to uh, uh, the Golden Temple. And we were supposed to get in there, but it was closed that day. Yes. But he told us about it, so we know a little bit, but this is a documentary going more into the awful event that and I do he told us about. I do believe we saw one thing that touched on this a while back. And I do think I remember hearing about this many, many years ago, but I'm sure this is going to give details way more than we've ever seen. Here we go. So. <clears throat> On a hot April evening in Punjab, a British general orders his troops to fire upon Indians gathered at an open park in Amritsar city. does not give any warning so people scramble here there they, they try and you know there's no hiding place in the bar it's totally a barren land so they fall into the well while running they try and tangle on the walls where they're shot all the eyewitness accounts are so dreadful i mean i i really found it difficult to read some of them because it was it's so awful what he did before we understand how this came to pass let's rewind the clock and go back a month or so to March 1919. The First World War had ended and Punjab was under the oppressive regime of this man, Lieutenant Governor Michael O'Dwyer. On the 10th of March, the British passed a new law called the Round Attack. Anger among Indians comes to a boiling point. In India, the Round Attack is referred to as the Black Act. They could be arrested uh, without, on suspicion, kept in jail without trial for two years and there was no appeal against that. That means, that's why they, they, this popular name for them, Na Dalil, Na Vakil, Na Abhi. And that is the time when Gandhi appears on the scene. And Gandhi brings with him an anti-Rawlit act event. Satyagraha. Oh, yeah, yes. It becomes his first really major successful Satyagraha. And what is very interesting is that most of the most successful Satyagraha ever to be held are in cities of Punjab. By the end of the month, the wildfire called Gandhi had spread all over India. Amritsar was not aloof. Within a week, two local leaders, Dr. Sefuddin Kichlu and Dr. Satyapal, had organized two successful hartals in the city. The 9th April was a Ramnami day, a very uh, a traditional Hindu festival. Normally, it would uh, the procession would be taken by the Hindus. But for the first time, we see that Muslims also joins this procession. Everybody who participated came from different communities. This is very much a Hindu-Muslim-Sikh 
even Christian story. For the British, whenever the people, large number of people, the crowds are on the street, they are always reminded of 1857. And this was even more frightening for the people there, for the people who were ruling India at that time. Because they could not, I mean, all their efforts to divide and rule seemed to be failing in front of their eyes. The Hindu-Muslim unity had frightened the British and the administration of Lieutenant Governor Odwaya had decided Satyapal and Kichlu had to be arrested and kept secretly in Dharmshala. So Satyapal and Kichlu, uh, when they are called to the DC's house on the 10th <laughs> of April, uh, they go there very peacefully expecting that they can have a discussion and dialogue with the DC Irving who is, by the way, who has just about arrived in Amritsar, is extremely nervous again seeing all these crowds, and he arrests them as well. And this arrest by trickery takes aback the people who are already, they are actually um, in the process of doing the Satyagraha. So the followers, uh, as usual, they collected together and went with a faryat uh, uh, to the deputy commissioner that uh, release our leaders. There was, you can say, confrontation between the uh, the crowd and the police, and uh, they were fired at. Around 20 people died. Hundreds and thousands of people were on the streets, and those who were coming back, they were so angry that they also ransacked, looted, uh, burnt uh, British buildings. The turning point came during the rioting on the 10th of April. Five British officers were killed and Marcella Sherwood, a British teacher and missionary, was accosted and assaulted in a street. This brings down the ire, the anger, the brutality of the entire British Raj, whatever representatives they have in Amritsar, upon the people of Amritsar. And there is now no going back. This street would later come to be known by different names, such as Crawling Lane and Kodio Wali Gali. the 11th of April is a day of mourning for the city. On the morning of 11th, uh, permission was taken and after repeated requests, they allow the the local government allow the people to dispose of the dead bodies. But things were about to get a lot worse. In the evening, Brigadier General Rajal Dyer is brought in from Jalandhar to control the situation in Amritsar. So Dyer is somebody who is lived in India, he was born in India, he has, um, has speaks fluent Urdu, Hindustani, he understands, actually he's a very good rapport with his soldiers, but when it comes to this particular incident, it seems that he was actually quite prepared to teach them a lesson they would never forget. The next day, Daya takes a round of the city and makes a series of proclamations. They were made mostly in places where poor people lived, where Kashmiris lived. Half of the city in fact was left uh, as such. And uh, one more thing I would like to add, uh, add that even the posters 
uh, that uh, 144 has been imposed on in amritsar was not even posted uh, on uh, uh, on the wall of jallianwala bagh where usually public meetings were held there is a palpable tension in the air thousands gather in the walled city and make their way to the jallianwala bagh some are here to demand the release of kichlu and satyapal some are looking for a place to relax after offering baisakhi prayers at the golden temple reports of people defying the curfew reach general dyer who is stationed at rambagh he leaves with two armored vehicles and drives to the jallianwala bagh a distance of about 1.7 kilometers the entrance to the bagh is too narrow and it is impossible for his armored vehicles to go through so he disembarks and leads his troops on foot around 4:30 pm general dyer along with 90 soldiers takes position at the main entry and exit point of the bagh he says later that if the lane had been wide enough he would have taken the armored vehicles and and just shot at the people with the armored vehicles as well i mean so this is the callousness of the man he goes in he takes uh, troops from baluch who are baluchis and gurkhas so that you know they further they are far removed from the people of punjab and do not really have any kind of sympathy or would not have the shooting lasts only around 11 minutes only? there is no way for people to run british figures put like the dead around 300 lifetime. the indian national congress claimed around 1500 people lost their lives in fact there were very small 3 to 4 exits what we call small narrow gullies so people can't even think of reaching lala hariram behel was at the bagh on the day of the massacre he was shot twice and managed to escape the bagh but he couldn't reach the hospital on time and bled to death on the street 100 years later his grandson mahesh behel says they are fighting to get martyr status for the victims of the massacre indira gandhi ne 101 लाख 30000 लोगों को दिए जो उधर शहीद हुए थे ना ऑल ओवर इंडिया में परंतु हमारे यहां पे किसी शहीद को कुछ है तो का दिया नहीं गया उनको जाता रहा है कोई ऐसे जाते रहे हैं पर तो हमें पैसे की कोई दरकार नहीं हमें ये तो है ना कि हमें जल्लाने बाकी ताकि आने वाली जो पीढ़ियां हैं आने वाला युवा है उसको पता लगे कि शहीदों का क्या दर्जा होता है Regiment Dyer will go down in history as the butcher of Amritsar. Brigadier General Dyer as he was known at that time um came with a mission but he was not actually involved in the grander uh plans of oppression which were unleashed on Punjab by the Lieutenant Governor Odwyer. Uh, back home in England Dyer was a hero. I mean people thought he saved Britain. The days following the massacre saw martial law being imposed in the city of Amritsar. Indians were asked to salam every white person that they saw on the streets. General Reginald Dyer faced an inquiry by the Hunter Commission and was eventually asked to step down from the army. But his supporters raised twenty-six thousand pounds so that he could live the rest of his life in comfort. Meanwhile, the families of the Indian victims were given five hundred rupees by the government. But the Jallianwala Bagh massacre also marked the beginning of the end of the British Empire. It was after this massacre. that the bin market go returned his knighthood and a year later mahatma gandhi gave the clarion call for the non cooperation movement when we look back at the last 100 years jallianwala bagh stands out as a symbol of defiance by a people who refuse to be second class citizens in their own country mr speaker the tragedy of jallianwala bagh in 1919 is a shameful scar on British Indian history. As Her Majesty the Queen said before visiting Jallianwala Bagh in 1997, it is a distressing example of our past history with India. We deeply regret what happened and the suffering caused. I'm pleased that today the UK India relationship is one of collaboration, partnership, prosperity and security. Indian diaspora make an enormous contribution to British society. and i'm sure the whole house wishes to see the uk's relationship with india continue to flourish mm, what a really well done piece very well done i'm hoping it is you guys can tell us for sure obviously yeah, I mean, just from the 
the vantage point of the, the editing, the storytelling, editing, the visuals, the animation as yeah. well. Yeah, uh, it was really well done. What an awful event! <laughs> evil, evil. It's like no some, other word some of the stuff that Hitler carried out type evil, mm -hmm. like the fact that he you know, just brought people into a room and they thought they were getting, I think, a bath and gassed them to death. Mm -hmm. It's that evil. Yeah. And then to add insult to injury, that guy gets to live the rest of his days in luxury. Mm -hmm. And you give the people, families whose people died 500 rupees? Hmm. Yeah, no, why, why wouldn't, why in the world has India not given martyr status to the people that died there? You know, at, at least just in title, it should be, that seems like a no-brainer. Is there a lot of awful events that have happened in Amritsar? Because the, the uh, thing from the Punjab 1984. Punjab, yeah, Punjab 1984. Uh, uh, and then, I, and they're obviously they're known for their warriors, so they've had a lot of history. Mm -hmm. Has there just been a lot of stuff that's happened? Yeah, that um, one's unconscionable. Yeah, like it's un. Uh, like you can't even like, what would possess a person to do that? Possession. That's the word. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then all these other people had to have no conscience at all. I know who were part of it. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's one like you know you're obviously in the military. You have to follow his orders. But really, like at at to what point? Right. Like you'd like, you'd like to think that you know if you were in the military and someone's telling you to do an evil act, you'd be like, no. You would hope. You would hope. But yeah, I mean, going back to what happened with the with the Nazis. I mean, it's blind bigotry has produced some of the most atrocious happenings of one human <laughs> to another human being, whether it was this, or it was the Holocaust, or it was the lynching of black people in America, mm -hmm. uh, and the treatment of the slaves. <laughs> It all stems from bigotry in some some form or another. Yeah, yeah, and it's just there is you said it. There's no other. There's only two reasons for it, and they're linked. One is just plain evil, mm -hmm. and the second is a motivation to simply rule. And that's one of the reasons rulers want their people to be divided. Yeah, because when the people are unified, the rulers can't rule unless the people allow them to. So as long as you can get the people divided, uh, you know, that, yeah. blame that other oh, person. Heaven forbid the Hindus and the Muslims and the Sikhs and the, the Christians should all get together unified. Mm -hmm. That would strike fear in the heart of Britain. Yeah. They want them fighting each other. Yep. Because then they can go in and they can quell it and say, we're ruling you, you have to stop now. Mm -hmm. But when they're all together, that's why, that's why a lot of people in the South and in the North during the Civil War... They started to realize if the slaves wanted to, they outnumber us. Mm -hmm. If they wanted to unify and arm themselves, they could do it. Mm -hmm. And they started to panic. Yeah, it's just evil. It's just, just evil. I, I wish Awful. we were able to actually go in and. Yeah, it was. We were really disappointed. As was he. Yeah. It just was the one day they were closed and cleaning the place, and that was the only day we had an Amritsar. But I remember that <clears throat> that sculpture that was right outside the door. I tucked put my hands on that thing. Yeah, we uh, we had a very short time in, in Bung Chan, which was very sad. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful country. <laughs> it really like, is. Everything there was amazing. Yeah. Um, but, whew, that was awful. Yeah, this is one of those... But I never forget to learn about it as well, kind of yeah. to more knowledge about it and how yeah. awful of a tragedy it was. So, more videos to uh, educate us. Please let us know down below. Da din din da din din da da din din 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 da din